Jane and over to Sam now. Great stuff, thanks so much Jane and thank you everyone for coming, it's great to see so many of you yet again. I'm just going to get my screen shared. Okay. So welcome to part three, everyone. Um, those of you that have been here from the start will know that this is the third in the series and that we started off by talking about neoliberalism, privatisation and austerity and how that fits into the model of the broader capitalist system that we're living under. Last week we talked about the changing state of democracy in the UK and how the quite weird, um, quite archaic political system we have today is very much related to the outcomes of various fights uh, from earlier in the UK's history and kind of the big historical trends that were affecting um, how people were being forced to live their lives. But we're really, it's a really exciting one to talk about this week because we're talking about how ordinary people have worked together to change the ties of, of history and that we are um, active agents in that. So this is how we're going to structure the talk tonight. So we're going to talk about firstly about resisting capitalism, the growth of the workers' movement, trade unions, working class organisation in the UK, where that came from, how that developed. We're then going to go and talk about the women's movement that, um, you know, was happening at the same time in some ways, but most of the big wins came afterwards. So there's kind of two parts to that. Firstly, what we call like the um, early women's movement and then the kind of more um, liberatory um, movement that came afterwards. We're then going to talk about Thatcher's counter-revolution, so what um, Thatcher did that actually had broader social impacts on the way that we can organise collectively today, so not just um, uh, not just the policies and the kind of immediate term effects. But then we're going to reflect on people power in the 21st century, so what are some recent inspiring examples that we can learn from, and what lessons we should be taking from these historical examples and how we should be a starting point for how we should be um, thinking about these things today. But we'll be doing more on that next week. So I wanted to begin by throwing a question at everyone. So if the chat is enabled, um, can I ask people, what does a campaign or a movement need to do to actually win? So there's hundreds of campaigns at any one time, many of them fail to win their aims. So what is it that makes them win? What threshold do they need to meet uh, to be listened to, particularly by those in power? So quite an open question, but interested to see what people's take on that is. So we'll just give you a moment to reflect on that and post a short answer. Yeah, we can really talk on the side. Not stopping. So one or two people might not have um, heard the question, which was, what does a campaign or a movement need to actually win its objectives? So what thresholds do they need to meet in order to be listened to by those in power? Be large enough, be ruthless in achieving your goals. Mobilize 3.5% of the population. Interesting one. I just haven't seen that somewhere before. Strong, kind values that benefit everybody very nice. Sometimes have to become part of that, and that's an interesting one that we'll um, reflect on in here. Okay, thanks everyone. That's fantastic. So we will move on. So I just wanted to recap a little bit some of the concepts that we've discussed in the previous two talks. So. We talked about capitalism, how it developed and how it branched into different forms based on wider social forces that were going on at the time. So here in, in many other countries where union movements were defeated in the 70s and onwards, we got neoliberalism, which stresses privatisation, austerity and deregulation. In some other places, we get various types of welfare capitalism, where free markets are compensated for by high levels of welfare spending because the trade unions are often still very strong and the Scandinavian nations is the best example of that to date. We talked about the development of democracy both globally and in the UK specifically. We talked about what happened in most of Europe, an alliance between the emerging industrialist class, the bourgeoisie, the people that were making money out of hiring workers, and the 
So the owners of the factories and mines and so on, they allied with the working classes to overthrow these absolutist feudal regimes. So sometimes monarchies, but regimes that were not based on democracy or the rule of law uh, in a way that locked out this new rich class from political power. We talked about why that didn't happen in the UK and why that failed revolution is part of the reason we still have such an archaic political system. But as long as there have been economic systems that dominate and exploit people, there's been uprisings, unrest and rebellion. In pre-capitalist Britain, these were rarer, but with the industrialization society, huge numbers of workers come into contact with each other for the first time in those numbers. They spend hours at work together and they're often spending more time together in their communities and the other institutions that they create. So they come to see their common interests. And why can't they also work together to improve their own lives if they're working together to produce profit for their bosses? So we're going to start here by talking about history of working class movements. So we've talked so far about the broad historical forces that were done, things that were done to the masses in the UK and the world. The Industrial Revolution, creating massive wealth and poverty at the same time. People attracted to cities and forced off previously communal land by landlords. The calculations of a political elite uh, we're playing off different classes against each other. But now it's time to talk about what people did together in reaction to those forces and how they tried to create their own destiny. As soon as capitalism started disrupting people's lives, people fought back. We talked last week about how during the English Civil War, soldiers organised and demanded popular democracy. So democracy for every working person, which was a horrifying concept to Cromwell and his generals. We mentioned the radical movement that was influenced by the French Revolution that was said, saying that all men had the same rights. So in the very early 1800s, before you can say that the working class was fully formed in the UK, we were quite a fully industrialised society at that point. But at that point, a group called the Luddites were textile workers and they were smashing and threshing machines that were automating away their jobs, something that might sound quite familiar um, to us today. And even before that time, workers were trying to organise trade unions to improve their conditions and work for their collective benefit. But that, they were banned in 1799. They were legalised again in 1824, but there was a long running um, battle um, over the course of the 19th century over to what extent trade unions were legal and what they were allowed to do. So by the 1830s, um, Britain's economy had trans... Um, had been transformed to the extent that you could call it a fully um, industrial society. And workers responded with Chartism, the movement that we talked about um, a little bit in previous weeks, where it started off as being a call for democracy. So they published the People's Charter saying, we want annual elections to Parliament, we want a secret ballot, so our bosses or landlords can't um, bully us into which way to vote. Um, we want payment for MPs so working class people can afford to be um, MPs and universal suffrage for all, um, all men, crucially all men. And they, that movement used drama, they used escalation in how they um, fought their campaign. So their first uh, campaign in the 1830s was about a huge petition, over a million people signed this petition and it was put on really long rolls of paper and was really handed into Parliament in a really dramatic way that just made it very uh, symbolic. And when it was rejected, there were plans um, laid for a possible armed insurrection and revolution. So in the 1830s and 40s, the conditions existed where capitalism could well have been overthrown because we got to this point where workers were so upset with um, the inhuman living and working conditions that they were often in. They tried bigger petitions a couple more times and again, at the end of that point, around 1848, where revolution was sweeping Europe as a whole, there was plans for an armed uprising, there were shadow parliaments and so on, but um, did, not, did not succeed, um, arguably, some historians would say, because the bourgeoisie, the industrialists, the ruling class, had aligned themselves with the, with the older feudal um, ruling class that held government power because they'd given the vote to these people in 1832, they had allowed them into the political system. So that ruling class were kind of merged between two groups. So during this time, workers aren't just taking action to improve, 
improve their conditions, they're discussing how society should work instead. So what we're stressing here is the importance of ideas in how campaigns and movements develop and how that influences how likely they are to succeed. So we talked in the first week about the ideas of Marxism, how it analysed capitalism and the problems that it um, said needed to be addressed. And that's, that was just one uh, approach to what radical thinkers, particularly in the uh, 18th and 19th century, um, had in their toolkit, how they would change society. Robert Owen popularised the cooperative movement, um, which was designed to remove capitalist profit from the equation. So if you think about the cooperative bank, the cooperative supermarket that we have today, they are kind of remnants of this grassroots movement of people locally setting up different cooperative societies to provide um, essential services for people in working class communities by cutting out um, the, the capitalist profit, essentially. Now, throughout the 19th century, capitalists and the government are cracking down on struggles for better conditions. We saw, as I said earlier, how trade unions were either legalised or banned or picketing was made more difficult um, at various points in, in the century. So, for example, picketing is when you're standing out, striking workers are standing outside their workplace and they're trying to stop their colleagues from going into work because if you've got a solid strike, you're interrupting the uh, accumulation of profit, you're stopping your boss from making profit, that's hurting the bottom line and it's forcing them to come and talk to you about better conditions. It doesn't always work, but that's the central idea behind, behind it. And you know, the the way that workers are talking about ideas throughout this whole period, by the early 20th century, it's quite normal for industrial workers to be doing a shift in a factory or a coal mine and be reading Marx by, can, by candlelight. The South Wales Miners' Federation, which was um, north of where I live in Cardiff, the some of these communities were so dominated by one industry that a kind of working class culture dominated everything and people were just thinking about well, we're going to have a revolution. The question is, what, what kind of society is going to replace it? And people saw self-education um, as a kind of liberation from the society that, were, that they were living in, as well as struggling in everyday life for better conditions. So from the late 19th century, mass trade unionism emerges in Britain. You had the failure of the Chartist movement. There was then a relatively quiet period where very often it was higher skilled workers that were trying to organise collectively and to improve their conditions and often not interested in the uh, so-called un unskilled workers. That's really changing by the 1880s. There are big strikes by matchmakers, um, very much women at that point, and dockers in London that inspired other non-skilled workers to unionise. And you have a transform, transform situation where membership of trade unions stands at 6.5 million by 1918. And this period sees coordinated action to fight for improved factory conditions. And the demand for an eight hour day is internationally coordinated by the second international. So that's a international group of trade unionists, socialist parties and so on, Groups of people who were motivated by the call that Marx made for workers of all nations uh, to unite because they believed that in order to uh, have a successful uh, revolution, it had to happen more or less simultaneously in, in all countries. So Workers get more radical and more militant as you come into the 20th century because of the growing unionization of workers, the scale that they can call on, the increasing levels of class consciousness and solidarity. So people are increasingly seeing either through taking part in strikes, through taking part in conflicts against their bosses, or through um, educating themselves that they have a collective interest. Um, miners have in, uh, the same interest with each other, but they've also got the same interest as dockers. So you've got a lot of um, solidarity across the economy going on at this point. You've got particular hotbeds of militancy like the Clyde shipyard near Glasgow and the South Wales coalfield that are steeped in socialist ideas in almost every area of life. Um, and at the same time, now that trade unions have become very big, um, they've developed bu bureaucratic HQs where there is a tendency for the, the leaders at the top that are in salaries, jobs being paid for by workers are sometimes trying to moderate things, to not have too much unrest, not to rock the boat too much. 
And in response to that, you have grassroots trades councils, which are basically coalitions of different uh, union branches and different workers within a local area that are challenging that leadership and driving further militancy and strike waves. And at this point, uh, kind of from the 30s, especially onwards, you have the, the British Communist Party, where many, many of these Labour militants are, are members of that and are very steeped in these ideas about what type of society that we're going to transition to. And again, it's worth thinking about what else was going on in, in Europe at this point, because in 1919, um, Britain sees the largest strikes that is seen to date, including by police and armed forces. I think that's illegal now. Um, but that was, in the, that was in the context of the 1917 revolution in Russia that was very much welcomed by a lot of workers. And at the time, it's seeming like there was going to be the same thing happening in Germany. And it very, it very nearly did happen in Germany. So very important um, time in the history of the working class movement was the general strike in 1926, where the miners' union, which is in a very important part of the economy at this time, everything is running on coal. If they're on strike, then everything finds it difficult to function, basically. They were locked in a dispute with the uh, management about cutting pay and having to work longer hours for less pay. Uh, as a result of an economic downturn, because the prices and the wages they were being paid were often directly related to market conditions in, in the economy. And they start off by having an agreement with the transport unions, but this escalates very rapidly. They get locked out by the managers and say, you've got to return to work on these terms. And basically trying to starve uh, these people back into work. And that escalates into a general strike. The Trade Union Congress, which is the collective organisation to coordinate trade union activity in Britain, calls this general strike that lasts for months and months. Um, and in this time as well, you have the first minority Labour governments that are elected off the back of this increasing organisation of workers in the UK. So the Labour Party is a direct result of all that work that's been going on in workplaces and in communities to build that class consciousness that we need our own party government. There, those are not those place, those uh, governments are not particularly successful for reasons we won't go into right now. Um, but other ways in which kind of solidarity with building across workers is that the 1930s saw uh, mass organizing against the tide of fascism that was engulfing Europe, so Italy, uh, Spain, Germany in particular. The British Union of Fascists were organizing and marching around the streets at this time, but they were kept out of um, the Jewish quarter in East London at the time, Cable Street, um, by um, communist organizers, by trade unionist organizers, just basically mobilizing the entire community um, against the black shirts um, walking through. And, you know, that was only in London, but there were various places, particularly the South Wales Mine, sending volunteers to fight on the side um, of the Republican government in Spain against uh, Franco, who had orchestrated a fascist coup in Spain, and the civil war went on um, not long until not, not long before the Second World War broke out. And you know, here's here's something that shows why ideas are so important. So, the NHS not not enough people know this. The NHS was not dreamed up by people in think tanks. It was based on a mutual insurance scheme in Tredegar um, in the coalfield. And then Aaron Bevan, who was the Minister for Health and Housing in the post-war uh, Labour government, um, he, he lived there and had been steeped in that union culture and all this stuff of self-education that we're talking about. And they had a system where you paid in an equal amount of your wages, basically, to fund a, a town-wide health insurance scheme. And if you needed to use that service, you used it based on your needs and it wasn't an insurance model that could run out or anything like that. And when uh, Bevan got into power in the late 40s, there was huge pressure from the doctors unions at the time to really moderate this demand and have an insurance based system that's less comprehensive, a bit more like some of the other European systems. And the only reason he was able to both bring that more comprehensive idea, the, the radical NHS that we think about today, and to resist those very powerful people saying we want something less good than this was because of that community that he came from and he knew uh, where his roots were. He couldn't be uh, corrupted by that political power, basically. So 
all this made these post-war reforms that we talked about a little bit um, in the previous sessions essential. So by 1945, the mass male working class was unionised, experienced in the struggle against the bosses and knew how to shoot a gun because they were coming back from war. So they had a lot of power. And if the powers that be tried to perhaps not introduce some of the social and economic reforms that we saw after the war, we might have had a very hairy situation, basically. Um, and the atmosphere of the war created a new collectivist common sense. If you're working together for the common good of uh, each other in society, then why can't you do that in peacetime as well? So I like to look at it in terms of, at this point, most basic material interests were addressed, making politics more about what could happen and less about basic survival. So what's it learned from these workers' movements? Organising into unions is at the foundation of winning better conditions and any political power at an election level or anything else um, emanated from that. Ideas have shaped what the ultimate goals are. Are we going for reform or revolution? That's, that was often a, a debate within the, the labour movement at the time. And that the conditions to overthrow capitalism in Britain existed in the 1840s to 30s to 40s and again in the early 20th century. So let's now move on to the early women's movement. So you'll, you'll see in a bit why I split this up the way that I have. So this phase was about women securing basic personhood, not being a uh, property of their, of their husbands, basically. So many um, women that got involved in these um, campaigns learned how to organize during the Chartist movement for um, working class suffrage and for those broader political goals that later emerged from that movement. And they started demanding the vote um, in various campaigns from the 1860s. A successful campaign gave married women more rights over their earnings in the 1870s, so it was the beginning of those basic rights. And the same year, propertied women, so women who paid um, local government rates to have to earn a certain amount, basically, or had to op occupy a house uh, above a certain value, they were allowed to stand for new local authorities, which gave them further political experience. So up until the kind of late 19th century, women were slowly being integrated into political society, although not, not in, in terms of having all those political rights necessarily. So the Tories and the Liberals had women's sections. They did a lot of the actual campaign work, knocking on doors, delivering leaflets and so on, but they still couldn't vote nationally. And there was a big participation by women in these growing socialist movements. So by the end of the 19th century, the control of women's basic rights um, by the husbands whittled away. So women were able to have more control over their own public, um, property. Dowries were le less of a thing. So you could say that maybe this kind of naturally came about both through um, women campaigning for these things, through the political experience they were getting, but also through this normalisation of women in civil society. But they still didn't have the vote or real freedom from patriarchy. So I think we're going to bring up one of our polls here if we can. So we have a question. Um, oh. Yeah, so the question is, why do you think women got the vote when they did? So in 1918, um, women over 30 with certain property qualifications got the vote. All women um, got the vote on the same terms as men in 1928. Why do you think that was? Just give it a few more seconds for people to say what they think. Okay, should we close that poll now, please? And I think we've shared that. So yeah, that's pretty decisive, isn't it? So most people will probably know that there were both peaceful or constitutional and more radical elements of the, of the suffragette movement. And most of you by 65% think that the militant wing forced the government to act. Interesting. Right. So the 20th century brought about differences in, and differences in opinion in how women should win the vote. So the first kind of national campaign organisation for it was the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. And they campaigned within the system, within the system, so by democratic means, and peaceful means, by using petitions, by lobbying and so on, and said that women should get the vote on the same terms as men 
And that was a largely middle-class um, dominated movement, which meant at the time, not all men, not all working class men had the vote and they were only arguing for um, women to have the vote on the same basis as men. But a, little, a few years later, you had the emergence of the Women's Social and Political Union, which aimed to win support within the labor movements. They, at various points, got quite close to the Labour Party in particular and were systematically uh, organising uh, working class women. They were going into factories in Manchester and signing people up, for example. And they were campaigning for universal female suffrage. So they, that was across class and uh, moving very much based in the working class. And the tactics of the latter group were also hugely controversial. So they did not say that they could win what they needed by acting within the system, because at this point, if you think about what we talked about last week, women were not part of the demos at this point. They were not represented within the political system. So um, it could seem very logical to resort to tactics that they did, which were things like property destruction, arson, smashing windows, um, setting post boxes on fire, hunger strikes when they were put in jail, um, very, very generalized um, um, targets against the public order, basically. So what we see here is a, a radical flank effect. So the militant tactics of the radicals made the constitutional demands of the earlier groups and the more moderate suffragettes seem more logical. And by the outbreak of World War I, the political elites had quietly agreed a route for votes for win. The Liberal government was saying that a new suffrage bill is going to come, that's going to enfranchise all men, and they will, part, people in the Liberal Party will be free to amend it, including Lloyd George, to um, include women's suffrage in that. So that, that was established before the First World War delayed things. So with the vote won by 1928, women's movements turned to securing material improvements like equal pay, free health care, and things that really improve women's lives within the lives that they currently have, which is basically to look after the children and to look after the home and to really um, do the unpaid work that capitalism needs for men to keep going out to work and earning money. So women at work and equal pay struggles Although divorce laws were loosened in 1937, economic reforms for women uh, failed until after World War II, largely. So we had women pouring into factories to replace the men that had gone off to war during World War II. And, you know, at that point, they were having a similar kind of um, consciousness building happening as had happened to male workers previously uh, from being in large numbers in the same workplace doing the same thing together. So at that point, equal pay for women. And, you know, they were also realizing, oh, yes, we can we can do this work as well as men are. We're contributing to war effort, we're building bullets and so on. So why shouldn't we have equal pay? And that became mainstream within women's organizations during the war. Um, and the Beveridge Report, which was basically during the war, pro producing a list of recommendations for how social um, entitlement should change really after the war. So looking at the poverty that you'd seen in the 1930s and um, what needed to happen. So that included recommendations for a health service, but that led to the introduction as well as the NHS, which is a very important thing for women, women's health, um, maternity leave from work and child benefits paid to the mother um, after the war. So you have a, a situation after the war where this combination of the active organization of women's organizations demanding things and the economy making things a bit easier. So post-war, um, you had labor shortages because there was so much rebuilding to do and um, yeah, basically everything needed to be rebuilt. So marriage bars were lifted where often married women um, could not stay in their jobs. They had to leave once they were married. That was particularly the case in white collar jobs. And women were beginning to interact with the working world on similar terms to men, but without equal pay, of course. And many were working long hours for low pay in repetitive and boring jobs in light industries and factories, particularly the case for working class women whose children were a bit older. So equal pay was one in the public sector in the 50s. Um, and that was basically due to competition between different parties. So we're thinking about what, what is the, the weapon that is actually available here to win this campaign. And... At that point, both Labour and the Tories 
neither of them had a reliable majority. They were both competing on the basis of the post-war compromise and who was able to give a better deal to the majority of the people. And the women, the female vote was a big part of that. So we split off a little bit here because that is the situation when women are broadly campaigning for um, economic rights to allow them to perform the roles that society has imposed on them, basically. But by the 1960s, a young generation has grown up with minimal worries about basic material security. You're living in a society where there's full employment, the welfare state and all those things that we've talked about that came in through the beverage report and that post-war Labour government. So women and others were starting to question their traditional roles in society on a really, on a scale that just had not happened previously. And one interesting tool that uh, women were using at this time was something called a consciousness raising group, where um, you might be feeling a deep guilt that you're supposed to be being a good mother, you're supposed to be being a good husband, but you're supposed to be working at the same time. But I also want to live my life the way I want to. I don't want to feel um, pushed into a, a, the role that society has for me. Lots of women were getting together and talking about these experiences collectively to realize that they shared the same oppression basically that patriarchy was a thing and that that was something they wanted to throw off and they wanted to live life on their own terms and have the same choices in life um that men did and at this point you'll also have an intellectual um movement going on called the the new left basically where thinkers almost saw workers as being relatively liberated because of the changes in the economy that happened since the war and there was a need to focus on new sources of domination exploitation and inequality so the women's liberation movement as it now was, was a very big part of that but it's also thinking about um racial um exploit racial inequality um lgbt people um not being able to live their lives as they want to and other groups so the women's liberation movement really exploded onto the scene from 1948, thanks to the continuing organisation of those movements that had been going at least since the early 20th century for their campaign for the vote, that then campaigned for economic rights for women to do their roles. Those organisations still existed and were giving the basis and the organisational skills uh, for women to set up these um, now more radical movements. And the celebrations in 1968 so 50 years since most, well, some women had been given the vote, encouraged campaigns for equal pay, equal opportunities, equal education, abortion on demand, free contraception, and 24-hour nurseries. Um, some of that will we take for granted now, some of it sounds a bit utopian, which is interesting, isn't it? Um, so there's a real flurry of legislative victories during the 60s and 70s, and maybe the most important form of this is uh, the Act in 1975, which was originally designed just to end discriminatory pay for women, but actually um, went into lots of other areas of life as well, like housing, the provision of public services. Just gonna see if I can find a few choice examples for you of those changes that, were, that came through. So 1974, free contraception on the NHS came in. Um, 1967 is when uh, the abortion, abort abortion was legalised, although there were some um, compromises with the establishment made on that. Um, in 1976, there was an act to stop um, women being assaulted by their, their husbands in marriage. Um, in 1973, equal guardianship of children was, was, was um, given, as well as equal say over property and income rights. And in 1978, there was maternity rights and uh, uh, protection from being sacked from your job uh, when you come back from maternity leave. So women's movements, what should we learn from these? So many learn campaigning skills through earlier class-based struggles, despite males, um, men's hostility often to, uh, to women's rights. There was a lot of cross-pollination going on. And then through the generations, um, that meant that people were able to organise collective action, strikes and permanent organizations that were the key to these later victories and something that's not talked about very much but these consciousness raising groups were critical to women collectively understanding patriarchy that's um that's my interpretation of it anyway i'm sure some people would think differently about that so going to talk a little bit about a couple of other things um, that were going on at this time 
so the we all usually learn something about the American civil rights movement in the 60s, 70s, and so on. But we don't learn very much about um, the one that happened in Britain, and it wasn't nearly as um, fraught, nearly as um, dramatic in some ways, but we need to really debunk this idea that Britain um, has never been racist and we have democracy and we're not like those horrible Americans. Not that, that's not the case at all. So race discrimination was still legal um, until 1965. Um, discrimination on housing in particular is very normal um, and he's really seen although of course people of colour have been in Britain for time immemorial there was a huge influx of people from um, former colonies from the 50s onwards and they were rapidly finding society that wasn't very uh, friendly to them basically so um, tired of discrimination and um, abuse and so on uh, one of the most uh, noteworthy episodes, uh, for me at least, from what I know about this history, is the Bristol bus boycott in 1963, because at the time, um, despite a labour shortage, despite there being a need for lots of um, workers and in industries like driving buses, the um, Bristol bus company had a bar on black drivers, um, because they were in coups with the union um, that believed that uh, hiring black people would lead to a downward pressure on white men's wages, essentially. So Paul Stevenson led the Bristol bus boycott, so similar in some ways to similar stuff that was going on in the States, where the black community collectively boycotted the buses, um, hurt, um, hurt the profits of that company and forced that policy to be changed. And then another key um, event was the Mangrove Nine, which was in 1970, there were um, there was protests um, going on by black people and they and nine people were taken from the crowd and arrested and, and put on trumped up charges, essentially. And that was really kind of the part of the emergence of more black power movements in Britain, which also did um, exist, but again, not in quite as fraught a way. And that was one of the first campaigns to shine a light on structural racism in the justice system. So one of the defendants demanded, uh, he got rid of white QCs, he demanded a, a jury of his peers because he thought that a white jury would not um, be, be fair. And those nine were all uh, acquitted. And then 1981, a fire in New Cross killed 13 black um, teenagers and 20,000 strong. There was a 20,000 strong march in London that blocked traffic and was generally being using these dis disruptive tactics to shine a, lot, a broader light on structural racism and to say, you know, we're here, we're not, we're not going to put up with this anymore. So again, um, you see this kind of radical flank effect where things like black power, which obviously more radical than earlier stuff is allowing um a lot of uh you know people to go well if we compromise and ask for the give people the original things they asked for then we're more likely to keep peace so this is an interesting one because legally uh, racial discrimination was banned in most contexts in 1965 but it's you might say that it was ahead of public opinion and culture by quite a few years, so that act didn't really guarantee that uh, people were not um, that people did not were, didn't face racist discrimination. Um, after that point, we still have huge problems with that today, obviously. Um, and Robin Bunce argues that the British Black Power movement helped to create real uh, social change that still hadn't really happened after um, that act was passed in 1965, including the cultural shift that enabled the Equality Bill of the 2000s better representation of ethnic diversity in the media so he argues that it's really kind of at the point that new labor uh, comes in where um social strategies have had more time to change as a result of more radical action rather than that law is passed therefore the problem has been disappeared so we've talked about a few um you know a, a few areas of movement over history we've talked about the workers uh, union movement, we talked about the women's uh, liberation movement, we've talked very briefly about civil rights in Britain, but it's important, I think, to talk about how up until this point, we had what you might call a mass society where people broadly saw um, that they had a lot of things in common and common interests um, with a lot of, with the majority of society, they might not have the same identity, um, they might not feel that they're exactly like that person, but People saw um, that they were equal as a class and had shared interests. 
And that was something that got really brutally attacked by the kind of broader ideology behind the Thatcher revolution, really. So we went from the mass society to the me society where government and all the kind of ideology and the mass media surrounding it really encouraged people to think as an individual. So by 1979, we had quite strong levels of social unrest um, in the country. There was you know, right, rising far right, um, the union militancy in response to the stagflation crisis was causing things like the three day working week. And it really looked like the organized working class could affect permanent reduction in the power of elites or even be talking about a transition more fully away from this form of managed capitalism that you had at the time. And, you know, as soon as the Thatcher government got in, they really um, carefully planned how they were going to not just stay in power, not just get a few things done, but have a radical change in the way that people relate to their themselves and the people that they relate to wider society. So they saw really the linchpin of trade union power as being the miners um, union, because if they went on strike, the power doesn't stay on and you can't produce things and the economy can't work. So after an earlier strike earlier in the 70s, they planned very carefully how they would have this final confrontation with the miners union. They were stockpiling coal. They were making sure that they could starve the miners back into work um, before it would have unacceptable consequences for them. And, you know, the, the miners union were one of the most militant unions. They were the people saying that we want to transition from this society, even though you know, we're living in relatively good conditions compared to what we have today, perhaps. So that was a part of a wider war on working class power. And if you think about policies like the right to buy, where people, working class people got to buy the houses at very reduced rates. Um, and the whole rhetoric of individualism has affected how we think about social change to this day. So it's a shift from being citizens or being um, working with our communities to win things or for our class to being an uh, individual. And we express our feelings about things by what we buy and what we consume. And with you know, the fracturing of workplaces, it's very difficult to see how um, people are forgetting they're getting out of practice of building organizations and working together to change things. So I've put this in terms of we encourage the post our placards and Instagram not to patiently build uh, collective grassroots power, but obviously we need to do more than go, go to a protest if we're going to exert the power to really change things. So going to say a little bit about people power in the 21st century. So I wanted to sort of say a little bit about um, Latin America, where things have been going a little bit differently to how they've been going in Europe. And just to say a little bit about the Black Lives Matter campaigns and the climate strikers, maybe what they're doing right and what we can learn from them and what um, we might want to hope um, to see from them to really uh, be successful, basically. So whilst we've seen the kind of diminishing of working class power and, and a community in Britain in particular, but it's a thing throughout the um, developed world, really, in most cases. What a really interesting um, side effect, some people would say, of the anti-Iraq protests in 2003, where there was huge mobilization against the war. It felt ignored. It seemed like a total failure. But um, people like Jeremy Gilbert, who's a, an interesting academic uh, these days, have said that that kind of take, took away the social license for the US to uh, go around policing the world and uh, deposing left-wing regimes in the way that it spent most of the post-war period doing. So in Latin America in particular, because of the way their resources were being exploited by the West, uh, for example, they had been voting for socialist um, parties for decades, but they were often being thrown out by um, coups or militias that were being funded or otherwise helped by the US government. And the fact that people were so outraged about the Iraq war really prevented um, America from continuing to intervene in Latin America in the same way, giving these leftist movements the ability to get into power, hold elections, sorry, to, to win elections, hold on to power, and to really be, bring about uh, dramatic changes in um, those societies. And some of those, you know, many of those governments are still in very strong positions. So, you know, things, things that we should learn about what those movements are doing when we're thinking about how we rebuild uh, progressive grassroots power in Britain 
is that many of the movements, many of the um, campaigns going on in those countries are very much independent of political parties. They're not they're not subservient to a political party. They're saying this is this is what we want. We're organising at a grassroots level for this, and yes, we will campaign for that party perhaps at election time. But people are voting for these parties not because of um, centralised communication from that party, but because of the consciousness that they've developed in their community or through those movements. And they know that um, because of all these coups um, funded by the US, that they need to be on the streets to support left wing governments and actually getting through um, their policies. So, you know, something worth bearing in mind is part of the reason I think these um, movements have been so successful and these governments have often stayed in power is because that they've been very good at reducing extreme poverty, uh, poverty that had been created by these junters, by these dictatorships um, that were basically helping global capital and instead distributing things like oil profits um, to the people to functioning social services. And I think that's an interesting alternative history and in that had Corbyn managed to get into power in 2017 and make material changes to the levels of poverty in the UK, um, where perhaps new loyalty would have come from in, in from surprising places. And you know, two two really uh, exciting, very recent examples from there. Um, Bolivia uh, re-elected the movement for socialism into government very recently this this year, I think it was in fact, um, after a US-backed coup. Um, basically, um, they just put up a new candidate for the same party and got back into power and carried on. And also in Chile, they've finally thrown out Pinochet's constitution and they're working on a new constitution that is uh, expected to be um, very uh, progressive in terms of public ownership of resources and so on. So um, finally then on to uh, some of the recent movements we're seeing in Britain like Black Lives Matter and the climate strikers. And you know what I think we need to learn from these, these folks is the way that they're using spectacle and um, the, the kind of moral outrage of young people as a tool and as a way of polarizing people. I think, I think that's been very, um, uh, very effective. And they're often coming about as a result of whirlwinds. So Black Lives Matter is a great example of this, where as a result of something terrible that happens, but it might be in America, these, this huge mobilization is happening from people that weren't previously organized. And the question is, are those people being organized into a permanent organization that can then be used uh, for winning more permanent change? And here in Cardiff, um, that's showing quite positive signs because uh, very tragically, a few weeks ago, um, a black man was um, died after being in contact um, uh, with police, Mahmoud, as his name was, and um, there were protests for five days outside the police station uh, where he'd been uh, detained. And the after initially the media not really wanting to talk about it, there's been sustained uh, attention and pressure on the police to explain what's been going on there. We've just heard that he somehow came into contact with 50 police officers uh, in that period, which is extremely worrying. And similarly with the climate, climate strikers, um, that symbolic action uh, of not cooperating and kind of civil disobedience, um, I think has been really, really positive. Um, I think it's less easy to say about its permanent organizational uh, presence and how influential that's going to be because it's been broadly demobilized by the pandemic, unfortunately, and people haven't been uh, doing got going out in the same way um, as, you, as you couldn't. But yeah, lots of themes from that that we'll cover in the final session about what kind of models of social change they're following and how we should be applying to those to dismantle um, and make alternatives to the capitalist system happen. So I'm gonna leave it there, hand back to you, and really interested to see what themes or things we want to go over more in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Once again, a round of applause via Zoom or the, the emojis or whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was well, like once again incredible with like a huge array of case studies and ideas um, of hey, positive, powerful movements that have delivered unbelievable radical change in our society. I like the fact that when we framed this, it was about looking at how 
you know, it's not just the ruling class that has changed history. And I think that's kind of like one of the key messages we kind of really wanted to pull through this. So um, lots of questions coming in, though you can still ask them. And I really encourage you to um, do that. If you've got a question for Sam, you can pop it in the chat to Jane. Um, so she will have Jane brackets questions here in her name. That's in the um, chat on the right hand corner. Um, so do send those through and we'll see um, how we get on. Um, in the time that we've got left. But we've got a few questions to kick off on kind of trade unionism, if that sounds okay, Sam. Um, like, yeah. Um, and the first one is um, just trying to get to grips with the difference between uh, like what is a workplace democracy and a union? And like sometimes you hear those things interchangeably. And do you think one is better than the other? I mean, for me, workplace democracy is a much broader concept, isn't it? Which you could be talking about a workers cooperative where workers equally own a company and have a direct say in the management decisions or can vote for uh, temporary managers that are of the workers that make those operational decisions in the interest of the workers as a whole but can be recalled um but still that still then means that people having an equal share of the income from that workplace um but you could equally just be talking in more narrow terms about um, workplace democracy in terms of, well, do we have a recognised trade union? So trade union really is about um, the workers coming together to have a collective voice to deal with disputes or working conditions um, in the narrowest sense. So you can think about it in terms of we're defending our collective interests from a very powerful employer. But you know, trade unions, um, certainly a little bit further back in time, were not only concerned with like what goes on in the workplace it was about um, building this kind of collective cross society class consciousness that is talking about questions like how are we going to organize society after the revolution and some you know there were some really interesting debates kind of late 18th century sorry late 19th century about between uh, marxists and syndicalists and um you know should we collaborate with the middle class on on ruling our uh, companies and so on so um i hope that yeah gives a bit of a distinction between the two things. Perfect, yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's brilliant. And then the, the kind of following questions on this um, uh, that are coming through around, I guess uh, the theme is around the kind of challenges that kind of traditional trade unions face. And they're quite interested in hearing your thoughts on um, some kind of like current difficulties in the like landscape of work and pushing for workers' rights. Um, and so I think I'll place these two together, but um, one person is saying, hello, just interested in this idea of unions as people's careers are getting more diverse and they're switching and changing between their lives and not necessarily in one industry throughout um, and committed in the same way. And then another person has um, brought in the point that um, trade unions traditionally find it quite difficult to recruit members and mobilise members who work in precarious or informal that, um, places of work, which I guess would mean your zero hours contracts, your kind of like delivery riders, your um, uh, not formally kind of secured work um, workers um, that have fewer protections mm -hmm. and also women, um, sorry, and also young people, sorry, um, and migrants who often end up in this kind of form of employment. Um, so how can we deal with this challenge if we want to secure workers' rights for young people, migrant workers, informal workers, um, and those that are moving between industries um, uh, throughout their career paths? Yeah, but we're in a, a very difficult period, unfortunately, because you know, it was much easier in the kind of era of mass employers and factories and so on for you got a smaller number of places, they can all see that they're being exploited and you almost had militants just going around the economy one by one saying, right, we're unionising you, we're unionising you, until you've got this really class uh, conscious thing going on and you've got a lot of collective power. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons for these neoliberal reforms that we've had since the 70s is not only because it directly increases profit for owners and, and capitalists but it's because it it weakens the position of workers in all these different ways so if you have um weaker contracts you're going to move around more often you might not be able to unionize on the same level or in the same union as other people in your workplace for example this fragmentation and breaking up our collective power is a fantastic tactic um for uh for capital really and you know there's, there's a question, isn't there, between, and, you know, unfortunately, 
the the big trade unions i'm thinking of like the unites the gmbs the unisons and so on um they all combined into these super unions um kind of uh, finished by around the 2000s i suppose into these huge like monoliths that got tons of money like i think unites got 300 million in reserves and but they don't seem to be really aggressively going around trying to unionize these um like you know um women heavy workplaces migrant heavy workplaces and all these places where people really really need the union so um there's something structural going on there i think in terms of the old unions and not stepping up to that challenge even though they've got quite a lot of resources to do it so those of us that are in those unions like unite for example um are in relatively stable jobs i think we've all got a responsibility to try and get involved in those unions and say Oi, what are you spending all this money on are you using it to uh, organize our brothers sisters and, and other comrades in um you know delivery drivers and so on and the other thing i suppose is that you know we're seeing little grassroots unions like the uh the wobblies and is it the united workers voices union which are going out and doing that difficult work that the others don't seem to want to for some reason so um fast food workers uh, going on strike um getting delivery drivers going on strike and so on and you know that those strikes i'm not sure are going to have like a big structural impact just yet but i think are having a really important narrative effect in terms of going oh yeah we are workers we're not an entrepreneur we're being exploited by this situation and you know as well as that we've got to think about the other ways that we are kind of exploited in modern day life that are not just where we work especially if you're like working for yourself or something and as i said before i think tenants unions is one good way of doing that but like if you're doing like running local campaigns about you know the provision of a local service you can talk about our collective interest as ordinary people is in having that park or having that social service and it's only property developers and very wealthy people that benefit from getting rid of those services so kind of using those same narratives that we used to use about being united in the workplace but about more supposedly mundane community campaigns brilliant thanks so much sam yeah like the forgotten tenants unions um but that's that's like brilliant and thank you so much for those um like responses and I, it's, it's, this is just sort of like linked to another kind of question that i'm going to kind of twist i think in response to that is i guess we um like having like, un like understanding the challenges that trade unions um face currently i guess beyond the kind of the changing state of work and employment um uh there's also been as we talked about the, like an attack on trade unions in terms of the power that they have to even mobilize their own members from um attacks on uh the number of people you have to have um registered to um uh like ballot um for strike action for example um and i just wondered whether you had any um thoughts on how uh there whether there will be opportunities to lobby for like or take back that power in order to like build and continue to mobilize and strengthen that trade union power so it feels like there's been kind of cut off the cut back off the cut back after pushback um do you think there are opportunities going forward for trade unions to make take back those legislative kind of rights i guess or claims mm. If you if you look back at the period of like biggest militancy, like particularly kind of 14 to 18, 30s and so on, it's really interesting how at some point it didn't actually matter whether the union bureaucracy had called the strike or not. And obviously back then um you didn't have the same restrictive rules for ballots need to be triggered in this way, all these people need to vote on it, and there needs to be a turnout bar, for example. But you know, it illegal strike action and other types of work stoppages were happening really frequently and you're seeing a little bit of that i think these days but you know i think that what we don't have a lot of power over at the moment is who is who is sitting in parliament for all the reasons that we talked about last week and you know i don't i don't think we're going to see a labor party for a while now that's going to say things like we're going to repeal the anti-trade union laws so whilst you know as greens we want our people there to be saying that this is fundamentally anti-democratic you know if we're if we're getting these smaller unions getting bigger maybe thinking about calling wildcat strikes or just using these more radical tactics that are outside of the kind of accepted 
common sense and if you can use that moral kind of critique of um we're being exploited by our bosses in all these different ways and the government is, is basically rigging it rig, rigging democracy so we can't even stand up for our own rights i think that and this is why we're taking this quote unquote illegal action i think we've got to have a serious think about um to what extent we want to ignore those rules face the consequences of it and maybe over time using tactics like that will force the big unions to um use more of their muscle to try and fight back against those limits that have been imposed thanks so much yeah maybe it's time to step up <laughs> um i suppose we're lucky in the uk that we've got such form like an unbelievable history and formalized um like unions and in many other cases and many places around the world we're seeing that kind of action because there simply is no other option um, so that was great. Thank you so much. I'm going to move us on to, we've got quite a few questions coming in um, following the kind of uh, conversations and topics on um, universal suffrage and women getting the vote. And I think we'll move towards this one, which is how far backwards have we gone RE women's rights, but also workers' rights because of COVID? Um, and how far have we got RE the left really uh, 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 sorry, how, how far have we got and are the left really starting to come together on this? Big questions. Can you try that once more, sorry? Yes, so how far backwards have we gone in terms of women's rights and workers' rights because of COVID, I suppose? So what's the, do you believe the impact has been um, on women's rights and workers' rights um, due to COVID? Mm -hmm. And uh, how far have we got to kind of win those rights back if we've lost them, I suppose, is kind of the question. Okay. Obviously, I'm only going to have a very partial understanding of like how much women's rights have been um, hit by uh, what we're seeing, but the most obvious things really are the way the work has changed and how women still do the majority of domestic labour. And you're hearing about so many employers now where <clears throat> you're, you're working from home, but you're basically expected to do the same amount of work. Um, your kids can't go to school so you've got to somehow be working 20 hours a day juggling your actual job and the childcare and you know I think there's some evidence that men are doing a bit more of that but it's you know through all the social stuff means that that's an enormous um, uh, effect on, on women and you know I think women have been affected much harder economically by the situation as well because if you're in a, a low-paid job in an ununionized job uh, in the hospitality sector, all the things that have been hit hardest by the economic situation we have, um, there's more women in those sectors. There's more women in the NHS, there's more women in care work, so uh, increased risk of you know being killed by exposure as well. So a real um, massive crisis that kind of compounds the earlier um, austerity situation that's had that impact. Um, so I guess it's shown us like how far we still have to go for real equality, more than you know any legislative um, setbacks per se. Um, workers' rights is a um, complicated one because, you know, like I've just said, um, the most vulnerable workers have brought, borne the brunt of this. Um, and, uh, you know, you're a lot more risked um, if you're in a low paid position. But we've also been shown, like, whose work actually matters and how, you know, if bankers um, are slagging off, uh, slacking off at work, then uh, working at home there's not much that happened as a result of that. But um care workers health workers teachers you know their work has to be done and society grinds to a halt without it so um you know i think i think you the unions had a really big opportunity at the beginning of the pandemic really to demand the impossible and let the government collapse if they weren't willing to give that i think it's really unfortunate that the big unions didn't co collaborate on that um but you know was it hundred thousand teachers on a zoom call a month ago in res as um, the government was trying to force open schools, you know, the unions are growing again because of the pandemic and um, the way in which people are seeing again how all our collective health matters and our collective, um, uh, you know, how, our, how all our health is, is connected. And I, I reckon that the union side of things is probably, there's a lot of positives to that. I think people are really realising how important it is to talk about our common interests. So... I don't know about, yeah, technically we're still under the same restrictions on uh, strike action, things like that. But I think, yeah, if if the unions as they are really use that momentum that's been generated by the new membership and the new awareness, then we could be um, onto um, a bit of a, not a golden age, but like certainly 
um, an improvement on the situation we've had for the last decade or so. Yeah, it's been unbelievable to see the, the National Education Union's growth and ability to mobilise. Okay. Can you, you were quiet and now you're back again, I think. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I tried headphones. Um, fabulous. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, yeah, like absolutely. It's exciting to see some like unions like National Education Union like really grow and kick off um, at, the, at the awful state of education that we're seeing at the moment in COVID. Um, so the next questions that we have are uh, kind of more around movement building and um, challenging capitalism and this kind of like antagonism with workers and capitalism capitalists like pushing back and forth and one question that we have is um, a tricky one and we love throwing you these <laughs> the question is we have learned that a capitalist strategy is to give out as little change as possible to prevent a full revolution in practice when pushing for change how much compromise should we accept and um, brackets this person has said, for example, many people would argue that a net zero by 2050 target is um, too late. However, some would take this as it's a better than nothing attitude. Um, so there's our question to you. Hmm. How much compromise should we accept? Okay. You know, there's a, there's a couple of things there, I think, in that to an extent, what you can demand is a function of like how much power you have. So if you are somehow able to shut the economy down with strategic economic sectors, then you can, you, yeah, you can demand the moon to a certain extent and you'll get something less than that. I mean, I always think that we should be demanding more than we think we can on balance get in that situation because it's a bit like that radical flank effect you propose something that's so scary that when you compromise um you get maybe what what you wanted in, in the first place of what maybe what you thought was possible um given the balance of forces and how strong uh, movements are at that point but you have to balance that out again against um you know what that's going to do for the morale of, of your movement so like in in terms of climate you know, I, I know you get some people writing things like, um, even though it's unlikely we're going to meet our targets, like doing almost that rather than nothing saves millions of lives, et cetera, et cetera. You can't, you can't, certainly can't at this stage be talking in those terms. You need to say this is what the science says, and this is what is required of fossil capital and the rich to save, to save the rest of us. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be going to the climate strikers and saying like, oh, actually, may maybe if you called for net zero by 2060 then you're more likely to get what you want i don't i don't, I don't think that's the way forward at all um i think that the, the radical demands that have been coming well you know science-based demands that have been coming from that movement is the, is the reason that the government has put through um quite shoddy targets that are obviously a lot weaker than that but you know the sense you said for symbolic demands that can get um really capture people's um, emotion so if you're saying we want like radical transformation that means that society looks like this this and this and 60 percent of the population are going to go yeah that sounds awesome then you're going to get an influx of people into your movement that makes it stronger than if you say we would like a, a two percent across the board increase in benefits or, or something that's only going to get um, a few techie academics in so you've really got to balance out i think um what you think is realistic with the amounts of power that you have and the, what story are you telling and what is the narrative and how much are you like, inspiring people by the things that you're demanding? Thanks so much, Sam. That was brilliant. And actually on the topic of sort of like mobilising for um, really radical change in terms of like climate commitments, like obviously um, COP, the like uh, climate negotiations, um, international climate negotiations coming up this year in the UK, supposedly in, in Scotland, um, <laughs> ought to be a kind of um, a big moment where you see some real commitments. And um, we've had kind of some questions around like um, movements for change in terms of mobilizing around climate. And I just wondered whether you might be able to share your thoughts on, um, I'll try and pull together a few of these little pieces, but um, there's some questions around like, are there movements like Extinction Rebellion or the school strikers that kind of kind of have that radical flank effect? What, um, what do those kind of climate negotiations, uh, um, 
make available to us in terms of opportunities and how can we ensure that we're building um, movements that have workers at the forefront as well as um, voices from the global south um, around that moment so there's kind of like lots of things happening how do we kind of pull that all together to ensure that it's a movement calling for a radical just transition and that one that has effect I guess is a big question but um, yeah within the context of what we've been talking about that would be amazing. Cool so yeah, this is going to be a really an, a unique organizing challenge, I think, because I can very easily see a situation where, yes, like the, the delegations are physically in Scotland, but there's still quite heavy restrictions on what you can go about and do in day to day life. Um, and that's that, you know, that is challenging because what the anti globalization movement discovered in the late 90s is that you can shut these things down entirely through um having thousands of activists from across the world um, working together on, on direct action and very quickly you know the organizers of these events worked out how to get around that the activists then innovators and it's kind of a bit of a cat and mouse race uh, up until copenhagen where there was not much you know the activists didn't do very much direct disruption of, of that stuff um so you know depending on where we are in that situation there's potentially a lot a lot we can do we might have to have a, a very hard think if we um, if there's still quite heavy restrictions on, on what we do that maybe what we do about that maybe if there's we have our own like symbolic actions across the uk that involve people from the global south that involve um workers but you know lo lots of people here will have been familiar with like the critique of xr in terms of um that it says we have this one true tactic that is going to solve the climate crisis, which is a very specific kind of direct action that invites you to be arrested, which is obviously not an attractive um, thing for uh, many people of colour that understand what contact with the police could mean in terms of risk, what it could mean to uh, work, types of working class people where you could lose your job over being arrested or not showing up for a shift, for example. Um, so. You know, the movement is very open to our diversity of tactics and you know people from all kinds of backgrounds being able to participate in a disruptive way but in a way that like is uh, has a level of risk that people are comfortable with right so um we need to make sure that movements like xr are not like uh leading like the the one only voice of what's going on in that sort of sort of situation um you know Lots of interesting stuff's going on in America about the Green New Deal and involving unions in those sorts of policies. So I think it would be a great thing now if the climate sector started talking to the big unions about, uh, like Unite, that you know employs certain people in emissions-heavy industries. Like, what kind of um, just uh, transition policy can you put to your members, and like, can we mobilise people to take part in the climate stuff uh, for that? But yeah, it's going to be really interesting as well, isn't it? How like the pandemic has like made people think differently about um, the climate issue and how um, vulnerable we all are um, together that we can't just like seal ourselves off. That our health, the health of one, influences the health of all of us, and you know that's an ecosystem. Plants an ecosystem that you know it's all it's, it's all connected. Really, hope that's slightly useful. Excellent. Thank you so much again for answering a huge question in a really insightful way in within a very short period of time. But yeah, no loads to think about there. So like, thank you so much. And I know that we're getting on with time, but I know that we started late. So I will just ask maybe one or two more questions if that's cool. okay, Sam. Um, but the, I thought this was a really nice one coming through. Um, again, um, talking about kind of um, women in work and um, the question is, uh, do you think there's some potential for women to create unpaid an unpaid work strike, essentially like collective action to refuse domestic labour? And then she said, this person has said, uh, I'm not sure how this um, exactly would work, but I guess my question is, are work strikes only effective because of the damages to profits themselves? Um, or is, is there a way that this can still kind of like um, push back against the capitalist model more widely? That's a great question. And I don't know if I actually mentioned it earlier, but I tried to come up with a like really basic um, take on what kinds of action actually like endangers the status quo. And it's, it was something like either strikes or something else that like directly gets in the way of profit being generated or something that just like causes so much disruption to daily life. Um, 
more so in the so if you look at like the, the radical uh, suffragists the um the kind of breakaway group that was you know just quite doing quite indiscriminate property damage and so on um you know that wasn't always directly blocking capital um but it had uh, its entire its intended effect eventually just because the amount of chaos it was causing and this kind of breakdown of public order and if you look at like a lot of revolutions in the global south it's kind of normal people just like invading police stations and stuff but it's a complete breakdown in public order that means that um the government resigns or whatever so um if you look at iceland in the 70s was it i think there was a, a housewife strike um where it's all banging pots and pans going down to parliament and so on and won very significant women's rights off the back of that so yeah um if if people were going for that I suppose one thing one way i'd think of it is you've got to do it collectively like go converge in one place and make it a dramatic thing rather than just a private thing because then that doesn't have the like broader um like pr and narrative effect that puts pressure for change but yeah um I, th I definitely think that those sorts of you know symbolic in terms of how it relates to capitalism but also causing chaos in everyday life um we might have to be doing more of that because of the difficulties with um unions and the, the way that work has been and um, workplaces have been fractured in the way we've been talking about it's a really interesting idea yeah thanks so much sam fab um and i'm gonna throw in one actually if that's okay that's kind of was in response to something you were saying earlier in the q a um that i think kind of brings up another interesting question if that's all right um which was when we were talking about um the impact of covid on um workers and how we've seen essential workers um particularly um yeah, put at the forefront of risk um, and are, are struggling through this in particular. And um, the question is, um, how useful is this narrative of um, or language of like essential workers? Because in some ways it's highlighting that the working classes are those that are making the um, making the society happen like work and continue and they it's not the bosses and the bankers that are, and the landlords that are, are making society work and continue but it's it, it's the workers it's the essential workers versus the kind of way in which the government has been using like very particular list of workers to be seen as essential workers and not essential and someone has like highlighted for example um covid hasn't really shown um, what jobs are essential 100% in the sense that um, in the sense that many in non-essential jobs have kept theirs while there are others working in charities who have lost theirs and and they would argue that like the work of charity jobs e.g fundraising for prostate cancer uk is like an, a, a, as as essential as other areas of work even though it might appear to be a kind of um a, a more middle class area of work for example or where it has been more possible to furlough people so um, yeah, there's some interesting questions there around the language of essential workers, what it means to be a worker and how we can find solidarity in this kind of um, strange uh, shared and not so similar experiences that we all face. Hmm. Yeah, this just makes my mind bend a little bit in terms of like, we're coming up to a year since this all kicked off and the kind of radical potential that people were thinking about at the time and this disruption to like capitalist realism that was happening and you know there being quite a clear divide on oh we can see now what's essential work and what isn't and how that's yeah really being bent by the government both in terms of like these people must go to work when it's clearly not safe as well as um well having a cleaner in your house if you're paying them it's essential and like very the private sector won't be pub um punished for forcing people into work when there's absolutely no reason to be in the office is there um essential yeah there might be something in there about like the time has gone now for that kind of framing and that it's now something along the lines of you know um we won't let work kill us or like thinking about creative ways of doing so um, solidarity with people like teachers and, and so on which is you know difficult under lockdown conditions but there might be some social media campaigns in there where rather than just oh there are a hundred thousand teachers today on a, on a zoom call other unions organizing like symbolic actions or just in individuals or even the young greens saying we support this campaign and we're like we're doing a like um selfie placard like campaign online saying that you back these workers so on so yeah lots of creative potential there um 
yeah, that's an interesting one. This essential frame is not really um, the right thing anymore. But yeah, we're all we're all navigating these questions together, aren't we? And um, yeah, our relationship to work and how we can use that for political struggle is going to be changed for quite some time, I think. Thank you so much, though. Yeah, brilliant answer and lots to think about as well. Yeah, I like that. We'll work these out together. I think we are working out. Someone just said in the private chat, um, zero COVID, um, which I think is, mm. is probably one of the better. I think I think that's a very effective like um, union campaign to really cut through the, the narratives that the government's trying to do to divide us, which is just saying we need a policy that strangles it. So, yeah, yeah great point. Nice one. Yeah, good catch. Um, and thank you to whoever contributed that. OK, fab. And I know that we're going over time. But maybe I will ask my next question as also a feed in to next week, if that makes sense. Um, so you can say as little or as much as you like to tease people towards our next lecture next week with this one, because the question is, um, how do you feel the Green Party's history of um, kind of uh, being involved in people powered movements or coming out of people powered movements and social movements has shaped the kind of Green Party's um, politics and approach to people powered movements, trade unionism, um, and our kind of like uh, theory of change um, mm. in this context? That is a wonderful question. Um, you know, I, I touched on briefly earlier about how there was a kind of difference and a divergence between like the traditional. Uh, working class union movement and then this period kind of in the 60s when a lot of these basic things had been solved and people were thinking about oh, um, what other ways is my life uh, not very good and am I oppressed as a woman I, am I oppressed as a, a black person and, and so on and really leading to those new liberation movements and to me um, green politics is very much rooted in that latter thing more than the traditional union movement it's based in um, that generation that you know, had had it quite quite good and was starting to think about things like environmentalism and, you know, that's a thinking that has kind of continued through the um, our parents' generation, depending how old you are, my own's a bit too young for that. Um, but, the yeah, we've underplayed class historically in the Greens, I think, and there is a, you know, has been a tendency in the Greens to, like, disproportionately be from a kind of, like, NGO or like um, professional managerial class that feels relatively politically empowered or relatively able to make change. Um, and it's not necessarily looking back to the history of trade unions, history of the labor movement and how that gives us clues in how we can deal with the, um, the challenges that we're facing today. So I think we need to take the best from um, both of those two traditions to just be really simplistic about it. Um, but you know, they're equally green politics has gravitated on quite a left wing economic position for a reason, right? Because it's a kind of holistic system that realizes that you can't have um, poor people whilst there's like infinite riches of people going off on yachts and destroying the planet with those unnecessary luxury consumption. So yeah, I think the greens could do more with it, but I think they're on the way and that's something we'll talk about a lot next week. So. I'm, I'm really excited about that. We'll be talking in more detail about um, how we make change, what we've been, what's been working recently, the kind of theoretical underpinnings for that and so on. Amazing. Thank you so much once again, Sam. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Please do raise a, another round of applause. Um, it has been terrific. But don't leave yet, um, because, yes, as Sam said, next week is our final. And I, I know that if we're in a real room right now, I'd see you all moan with sadness at this. But next week is the last of these radical lectures. Sad faces on Zoom.